On the 8th of June in the year 632, news began to spread through the city of Medina, sending shockwaves of grief through the early Muslim community. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had passed away. For 23 years, the Prophet had led his community and received divine revelations to guide his followers. Since the faith of Islam pertained to the political, the religious, the ethical and the social, the Messenger of God engaged in all these aspects of community life. Questions of the nature of rightful Muslim leadership after the Prophet have remained central throughout history. Diverse Muslim interpretations have evolved over time, resulting in different beliefs and forms of leadership. Two major models of authority emerged after the Prophet. In the Sunni interpretation, the Prophet did not nominate a successor. The Caliph was understood as the head of the Muslim community, who administered the state and acted as the guardian of the faith. The religious scholars, or ulama, took over the roles of authority on religious and ethical issues among Sunni communities. Sunnis today are diverse, with four schools of law, or madhabs, the Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi'i. The Shia interpretation is based on the principle of hereditary leadership. The term Shia derives from Shi'at Ali, the followers of Hazrat Ali, alayhi salam. For the Shia, the Prophet appointed Hazrat Ali to be his rightful successor as the first in a hereditary line of Imams. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الرسول بلق ما أنزل إليك من ربك وإن لم تفعل فما بلغت رسالته والله يعصمك من الناس According to Shia tradition, this Quranic verse was revealed to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as he was returning to Medina from his final pilgrimage to Mecca. What was so important for the Prophet to accomplish that not doing so would mean not delivering God's message? Both Shia and Sunni historical sources record that soon after the revelation of this verse, the Prophet's caravan stopped at the oasis Gadir Kum, where he addressed his followers. The Prophet, quote, took Ali by the hand and said to the people, 
Do you not acknowledge that I have a greater claim on each of the believers than they have on themselves? And they replied, Yes. And he took Ali's hand and said, Man kuntu maulahu fa aliun maulahu. He whose mola I am, Ali is his mola. O Allah, support whoever supports him and oppose whoever opposes him. Unquote. For the Shia, the word Mola is interpreted to mean master and is a designation of Hazrat Ali as the Prophet's successor. They also affirmed that this designation was made at Allah's command due to the verse that was revealed before ghadir -ikum. The following verse was revealed to the Prophet after ghadir -ikum. Today I have perfected your religion for you completed my blessing upon you, and chosen as your religion, Islam. A related term to Mola is Wilaya, which is a central pillar of Shia Islam. Its general meaning relates to authority, whether temporal, spiritual or both. In the Shia tradition, Wilaya refers to the special status given to Hazrat Ali as the divinely designated authority over the believers. The Qur'an emphasizes obedience to those in authority, which the Shia interpret as a reference to following the Imam's guidance. The Qur'an states, O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. The Shia also emphasized the exalted status of the Prophet's family. One important saying of the Prophet is known as Hadith at Takalain, the Hadith of the Two Weighty Matters. The Prophet is reported to have said, quote, I am leaving among you two matters of great weight, the Book of Allah and my kindred, the people of my house, Ahlul Bayt, Unquote. The Ahl al Bayt refers to Hazrat Ali, Bibi Fatima, Hazrat Hassan, and Hazrat Hussein, alayhumma salam, as well as the Imams who are direct descendants of the Prophet's family. The status of the Prophet's family is reinforced by a verse of the Quran which proclaims Allah wishes to keep uncleanness away from you, Ahl al Bayt and to purify you thoroughly. The notion of spiritual leadership continuing in one family is also present in the Quran. Many verses describe the prophets as belonging to the same family. For example, there is a line of prophets descended from Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. Both of his sons, Nabi Ishaq, or Isaac, and Nabi Ismail were prophets, as was Nabi Ishaq's son, Nabi Yaqub, or Jacob, and his grandson, Nabi Yusuf, or Joseph, alayhumma salam. In this light, Allah chose certain families over others based on their devotion, submission, and faith towards the Divine as reflected in the following Quranic verses. Allah chose Adam and Nu, the family of Ibrahim, and the family of Imran above all mankind, a progeny one from the other. We have already given the family of Ibrahim the book and wisdom and conferred upon them a great kingdom. According to Islamic tradition, Prophet Muhammad was a descendant of Nabi Ibrahim through Nabi Ismail. Thus, in the Shia view, this elevated status and great kingdom extends to Prophet Muhammad, Hazrat Ali, and the Imams descended from them. The role of the Ismaili Imam is a spiritual one. His authority is that 
of religious interpretation. It is not a political role. I do not govern any land. At the same time, Islam believes fundamentally that the spiritual and material worlds are inextricably connected. Faith does not remove Muslims or their imams from daily practical matters in family life, in business, in community affairs. Faith, rather, is a force that should deepen our concern for our worldly habitat, for embracing its challenges, and for improving the quality of human life. The principles of the Imamat continue to develop over time. The most important aspects of the principle of Imamat were articulated by Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, who both lived in Medina. One important principle is ilm, which generally means knowledge. For the Shia, this term acquired a distinct meaning, referring to the belief that each Imam was granted divinely inspired knowledge. The belief in the institution of Imamat reflected the permanent need for a divinely guided Imam. The Shia cite a verse that relates to the interpretation or ta'wil of the Qur'an's message. No one knows its interpretation except Allah and those firmly rooted in knowledge. In Shia belief, it is the Imams who are firmly rooted in spiritual knowledge, which allows them to interpret the message of the Qur'an for every age and context. The Imam of the time enables believers to go beyond the outward form of the revelation, the Zahir, in search of its true inner meaning, or Batin. Both the Zahir and the Batin are viewed as essential to the proper understanding and practice of the faith, as guided by the Imam. This special knowledge is reflected in a saying of the Prophet about Hazrat Ali, which says, quote, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. Whoever desires knowledge should enter the city by that gate, unquote. The preamble of the Ismaili constitution tells us the ultimate purpose of the Imam's talim or teaching. Article F says, quote, The Imam's talim lights the murid's path to spiritual enlightenment and vision. In temporal matters, the Imam guides the murids and motivates them to develop their potential. Unquote. A second principle of Imamat is Nas, or designation. The authority of Imamat is passed on from one Imam to the next by way of Nas, which refers to the prerogative of each Imam to designate his successor. Just as Prophet Muhammad declared the Imamat of Hazrat Ali at Gadirekum upon divine command. A third important principle in Shia Islam is that of bayya, or allegiance. This refers to the act of acceptance of the permanent spiritual bond between the Imam and the Murid. For Ismailis, this allegiance unites all Murids worldwide in their loyalty, devotion and obedience to the Imam of the time. The Qur'an refers to the pledging of bayya in the time of the Prophet. Indeed, those who pledge allegiance to you, O Prophet, in fact they pledge allegiance to Allah. The hand of Allah rests over their hands. Hazrat Ali and his successor Imams are understood as the inheritors of the Prophet's authority. Thus, after the Prophet's death, it is on the hand of the Imam of the time that Bayah is pledged. 
As a result of this spiritual bond, Murids have celebrated their love and devotion for the Imams through expressions of poetry in different languages and cultures. The diverse Ismaili community has been united over many centuries by an allegiance to the living hereditary Imam of the time. Let me also emphasize the inseparable nature within Islam of faith and world, the intertwining of spiritual responsibility with the conduct of daily life. My responsibilities as Imam for interpreting the faith are thus accompanied by a strong engagement with issues relating to the quality of life, affirming the dignity of all peoples. Throughout history, the Ismaili Imams have through their ta'wil and ta'lim, continuously guided the Jamaat through changing circumstances in different political and cultural environments. They have also worked to ensure the safety, security and quality of life of the Jamaat and the societies in which they lived. Our identity as Shia Imami Nizari Ismailis is based on various subdivisions in the line of Imamat. The followers of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam are known as Imamis, whereas those who followed his brother Zayd as Imam are known as Zaydis. After Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam passed away in 765, the Imamis split into two branches. Those who followed Imam Ismail alayhi salam, are known as Ismailis. The followers of his brother Musa al-Kazim are known as Ithna Asharis or Twelvers since they followed a line of twelve Imams. The early Ismailis entered an era known as the Dora Satar or period of concealment due to intense persecution by the Abbasid Caliphs. For about 150 years, the Imams kept their identity hidden from public view to protect themselves and the Jamaat. Salamiya in Syria served as the seat of the Imamat. Despite operating in secrecy, the Imams organized the Dawah, which was a network of religious teachers or missionaries of the faith called Da'is. They conveyed the Imam's guidance and teachings to his followers in different lands, calling people to recognize the authority of the Imam of the time. In 909, the Imamat returned into public view when Imam Muhammad al-Mahdi was installed as the first caliph of the Fatimid Empire. He built al Mahdiya in present-day Tunisia as a new capital and seat of the Imamat. In 969, Imam al-Mu'iz extended Fatimid rule into Egypt, founding Cairo as his new capital city. 
the Fatimids were concerned with the quality of life of all their subjects. They governed a population from diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds who lived side by side in relative peace. A meritocratic approach allowed anyone to reach senior positions within the Fatimid state administration, based on their abilities, regardless of background. The Fatimid imams also emphasised intellectual search by establishing two important institutions of learning, Al-Azhar and Dar al-Ilm, the Academy of Knowledge, which had a significant library that was opened for all who wanted to use it. For the Jamaat, the Majalis al-Hikmah, or Sessions of Wisdom, were private gatherings in which Da'is taught esoteric aspects of the Ismaili Tariqa. They were only open to men and women who had pledged their bayah to the Imam. In 1094, the Ismailis were divided into two separate communities. The Nizaris were those who followed Imam Nizar, alayhi salam, whereas the Musta'ali branch were those who followed his brother al-Musta'ali. The Fatimid Empire continued under the Musta'ali branch until 1171. The Nizari Imams secretly relocated to the fortress of Alamut in Persia. Alamut was under the control of a leading da'i, Hassani Sabah, who was loyal to Imam Nizar. He established a network of castles in the mountains of Persia to protect the community from persecution by the ruling Saljuk dynasty. A network of fortresses was also established by the Nizari Ismailis in Syria. Peace was eventually reached with the Saljuks, after which the Imams re-emerged from concealment, ruling and teaching openly at Alamut. In the early 13th century, an incoming Mongol invasion posed a new threat to the Muslim world. Ismaili fortresses became a safe haven for those fleeing from the Mongols. Intellectuals and scholars of all religious persuasions found refuge under the patronage of the imams working at the famous library at Alamut. In 1256, the Ismailis were forced to surrender Alamut and other strongholds to the Mongols. But the line of imamate continued. While the imams went into concealment in Azerbaijan and later Persia, the Dawa continued to guide the Jamaat in Syria, Persia, Central Asia and South Asia under the leadership of the Imams. By the middle of the 15th century, the Imams had established their seat in the Persian town of Anjadan, where they remained for several generations. The Pandiyati Javan Mardi, or Councils of Chivalry, is one work of guidance from this period attributed to Imam al-Mustansir Bilal, alayhi salam. In it, the Imam urges believers to recognize the Imam of the time and to live by the ethics of the faith. As Sayyids or descendants of the Prophet, the Imams eventually gained prominence in Persian society, including being appointed to regional political positions. In 1817, Imam Hassan Ali Shah was given the title of Aga Khan by the Qajar monarch Fat Ali Shah. By the 1840s, political circumstances had changed and the Imam left Persia, ultimately settling in the Indian subcontinent. He established his seat at Mumbai which had an uplifting effect on the religious and communal life of the Jamaat everywhere. It helped the community in India to gain a greater sense of confidence and identity as a Shia Muslim community and to lay the foundations for its social progress. In 
Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah alayhi salam, established Ismaili constitutions and a system of councils for administering Jamaati affairs. He built hospitals and schools, particularly emphasizing the need for girls to be educated. His jubilee celebrations enabled the creation of new institutions to improve the financial standing of the Jamaat. He worked for the progress of all of humanity, becoming involved in the independence movement of the colonized Indian subcontinent from British rule. He also served as president of the League of Nations, the forerunner to the United Nations. Following Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah's 72-year imamat, the longest in Ismaili history, he designated his grandson, Shah Karim, to succeed him. Ya Since succeeding to the Imamat on 11th July 1957, Maulana Hazar Imam has worked tirelessly to fulfill the mandate of Imamat in both spiritual interpretation and improving the quality of life of the Jamaat and wider society. He has continued to strengthen Imamat institutions worldwide. In 1986, he ordained a new global Ismaili constitution to consolidate the social governance of the Jamaati institutions and the Aga Khan Development Network, or AKDN. The engagement of the Imamat in development is guided by the ethics of Islam, which bridge faith and society, a premise on which I established the Aga Khan Development Network, known as the AKDN. Its cultural, social, and economic development agencies seek to improve opportunities and living conditions of the weakest in society without regard to their origin, gender, or faith. In continuing the historic promotion of the role of the intellect, Maulana Hazar Imam has established three institutions of higher learning. The Institute of Ismaili Studies, or IIS, the Aga Khan University, and the University of Central Asia. Established in 1977, the IIS promotes scholarship and learning about Muslim cultures and societies. Their work includes training professional religious education teachers and those in the Jamaat with academic interests in Islamic studies. The IIS also develops global religious education curricula for students in the Jamaat to learn about their faith, identity, and the history of Muslim civilizations. Educating about the pluralism and intellectual contributions of Muslim civilizations is part of Maulana Hazri Imam's response to widespread misperceptions of Islam in many Western societies. He has also encouraged the Jamaat to act as ambassadors of the faith by living ethically and presenting a positive face of Islam. The Ismaili centers also act as ambassadorial buildings for the community, seeking to build bridges with wider society. 
in an endeavour to help create more peaceful societies around the world in which difference is valued and appreciated, Maulana Hazar Imam has established the Global Centre for Pluralism. The Imam engages in diplomacy and bridge building with governments and civil society organisations around the world. The activities of the Imamate were further strengthened by signing an agreement with the Government of Portugal to establish a seat of the Ismaili Imamat in Lisbon. Maulana Hazar Imam has guided the Jamaat through changing contexts, including many periods of difficulty and crisis over the past six decades. This includes supporting Jamaat through instability in various countries following the end of European colonialism and the collapse of the Soviet Union, through situations of conflict, natural disasters, poverty and food shortages, helping to resettle refugees who were forced to leave their countries of origin, assisting in rebuilding societies devastated by war and poverty, and guiding the establishment of Jamaats in the Western world. In 2020, through the COVID-19 pandemic, Maulana Hazar Imam's guidance and support has continued. AKDN's health institutions serve on the front lines of the pandemic. When Jamaat Khanas closed, the Jamaati institutions adapted to engaging and educating the Jamaat virtually in wishing to provide ongoing guidance and blessings, Maulana Hazar Imam took the unprecedented step of sending messages online to the global Jamaat. No matter what difficulties the Jamaat has faced, Maulana Hazar Imam has looked after the Jamaat, promoting hope and a positive outlook with as much love and care as any parent. Maulana Hazar Imam's Imamat has also had opportunities for celebration and happiness. From the establishment of new institutions, visits of the Imam to the Jamaat, to celebrating epochal events like the Imamat Jubilees, there have been many moments of joy. Maulana Hazar Imam has also received awards, honorary degrees, and other honours from countries and institutions around the world. Through over six decades of change, there has been one constant, the Imam's ever-present love, which illuminates our path through the darkness. Thus, Maulana Hazar Imam has given continuous guidance on matters of faith, reminding us not to forsake deen for dunya, to constantly remember Allah and the eternal nature of the soul, to be regular in the practice of the faith, to engage in intellectual and spiritual search, to share knowledge and to live by the values of generosity, kindness, humility and serving others. Throughout our Jamaat history, the Imams have been the central axis around which our faith and our community have revolved. We are blessed to have the Imam of the time guiding us throughout our lives, helping us to navigate continuous change through good times and bad with his immense love and affection. The love of the Imam knows no physical boundaries, no mountain, no river, no desert can stop the love of the Imam for his Jamaat worldwide.